You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. It's David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy with the That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the show, or maybe a gratitude nugget, uh, maybe how you can become a gratitude believer, something I feel strongly about the followers, maybe one to three takeaways from the show, depending on what comes up on the show. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. It is downloaded on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and anywhere else that podcasts are available. Uh, Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I really appreciate that. And then also to purchase a gratitude journal, a lot of people ask me about that, or to find out more about my gratitude speaking, gratitude coaching, or one-on-one coaching, you can go and connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com. So let me get on to the show and introduce my guest. Very excited to have this young man with me today. Rusty Gaylord, let me tell you a little bit about Rusty. Rusty's the former worldwide director of finance at Apple, and he left his 25-year corporate career in 2019 to pursue a profession with more meaning and purpose. Great words. With over a decade of personal and professional development experience, Rusty was certified as a transformational leadership coach in 2018. He is an international best-selling author. We're going to talk about that book in a second. A sought-after speaker and a leadership coach. He has a BSE from Princeton University and an MBA from Stanford University. So, Rusty, I have a feeling that that bio and, and intro could have gone on a lot longer, but uh, we'll keep it short to get to it. So, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, David. Super happy to be here with you. Excellent, excellent. So, tell. I always like to start out with this, just kind of develop a context. Tell the listeners how you and I met. Well, we met through a mutual connection and. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I've come to greatly appreciate. And I, I had some of this in my career at Apple, but I see it especially as an entrepreneur is that the people that you associate with make all the difference. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we both have a mutual connection, Ellen, uh, Melko Moore, right. and Ellen's great. And she works with great people. And so when she said, hey, you should meet David, that gratitude guy I said, absolutely. There's no question in my mind because when you work with great people, you're surrounded by great people and you get to connect with great people. So it's a, it's a huge win. Actually, it sure is. And I think I've probably commented to you before. I just enjoy this experience when you meet somebody and in the first 30 or 60 seconds, I just love this guy. Where did you, oh, you met him through Ellen, you know, he says, and it's cool and stuff. So, so let's back up a little bit, speaking of context and just start with a little bit. You did something that I think a lot of people think they want to do, and maybe some do, but a lot don't. And that is corporate world into a world of entrepreneurship. And then now writing your own book, breaking the code, which again, we'll talk about in a second, but let's go back a little bit and talk about that time at Apple and how it impacted you as far as I always want to know about the gratitude piece and appreciation and thankfulness. But what was that like in that world for the time that you were there? I was there at a great time. So I started Apple. Steve Jobs was there. The iPhone was not yet introduced. The wow. iPod was the biggest tech hit of the time. And, uh, you know, I was there through the iPhone being introduced and launched, the iPad, the Apple Watch. So I was there for 13 years. And it was an amazing time to be there. And what's so interesting is that my viewpoint at that point, at that time in my life, was that I was going to find a great company and continue to work there and stay there for a long time. And I did. I was there for 13 years because that's the way I was. I grew up with a dad who believed that. Mm. And I was very grateful for being at Apple that, during that time. I was grateful for the opportunities. I loved the people I was working with. I had so much good going for me. And yet I knew, as you mentioned in the introduction, it was missing meaning and purpose. And I just started to question, especially towards the end, why am I doing this? And am I going to look back on my life and feel happy with how I invested this time and energy in my life or not? 
And I thought the answer was not, but I had no idea what else to do. Interesting. And one thing I always wonder about when you mentioned missing meaning and purpose, and I think of uh, purpose and passion as another word that goes into that, maybe destiny sometimes too. When you were in those 13 years and as you're going through that, was it sort of, was it one day you woke up, I can't do this anymore, or was it just this sort of this drip, you know, what is it, death by a thousand cuts? What, was it how, which, which way did it happen to you when you finally uh, told your family, you know what, I got to leave and I got to do something else? It was more the death by a thousand cuts. It, it, was, it was just something that crept up on me over time. Now, there's, there's some backstory to that, which is two, two pieces are relevant. One is about six or six or so years into my career at Apple, I was the director of finance. I was doing great. I was progressing up the ladder, you know, going to be at this company for a long time. And I ran into this conflict, which was... I was in a worldwide role and in the evening in California is when everybody in Asia wakes up and gets to work. Mm. And I was, because I was in a worldwide role in the evenings, I needed to be on the phone. I was talking to these people and I was working with them, but I also needed to be home because my son was two and I wanted to be home for dinner and to put him to sleep and all of those things. At the, that point in my life, I didn't really have the awareness or the mindset to find a way to do both things. And so I thought I had to make a choice. And the choice I made was to hire myself for a lower level position. I was hiring a job on my team and I took that I like role that. and had my boss backfill me. When I did that, I basically put myself into a dead end job. And I was in that dead end job for a lot of years. And it was over the years in that dead end job that the paper cuts started to accumulate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just said, hey, I'm not moving up the chain. I'm doing more or less the same thing year after year. I could stay here, I could be stable. I could do this for the rest of my life, but it just, it, that's just felt like death by a thousand paper cuts. You know, it's, I, I, I couldn't do that. And did you find the, when you mentioned that, uh, hired myself for a lower level job, did the people that you were working for, I guess, having been in the corporate world, I worked for Nordstrom for 15 years and very, very familiar with moving up and one in uh, one um, promotion after another. Were the bosses, if you will, like going, hey, what's wrong with you? You're going the wrong direction. You're supposed to be going up. And why are you going down or staying level? Was that ever a problem? There was, it wasn't a problem necessarily, but it was, there was definitely some confusion. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, what I did was very against the grain. Uh, and, I, you know, I, when I look back on it now, I, part of me feels like it was absolutely the right decision. And, you know, when I look into the past, I think everything that happened happened for a reason. And it brought me to this place where I am today. So from that standpoint, I'm totally happy with that decision. But I look at it and on a personal level, it was a great decision. On a professional level, it was not a great decision. And I think with the awareness I have now about leadership and being what it takes to be successful and finding a path forward, I think I could have managed both things. But I just, I didn't have that awareness at that point in my life. I think something else too, that's really a factor. This was for me as well. Uh, was our families, you know, whether it's their wife or our children or whatever. And you mentioned, I think you said your son was two, I think you said at the time. And any age is important. I mean, certainly from birth up till 18, if they go off to school or what have you. But it's so important because you can't get those years back. And I've often thought you can always make more money. And so when you, you know, the death by a thousand cuts, and then you make that move, and then talk about sort of the transition into this leadership, uh, this leadership role and becoming a leadership coach. How did that work? Well, I was looking for what I was going to do. As I mentioned, I, I knew I wanted to make a change, but I didn't know what it was. And I got the idea because I was attending a talk and this person had us go through an experiment. They said, don't worry about all the things that hold you back because most of us rule out a bunch of options because we think they're not possible. I wouldn't make enough money. My parents wouldn't approve or my wife wouldn't approve or it would disrupt this family stability, whatever. We all have reasons. But they said, just ignore those reasons for just a few minutes. And if you were to ignore all of the reasons why you can't do something, what would you want to do? And I'm so grateful for that person who showed up in my life that day to ask me that question, because that's what opened the door to me to becoming a coach. And my very first desire was to have conversations with people about what matters in their life. Mm. to have real meaningful conversations. So many of us go through life and don't talk about anything that really matters, what we really want in life, what's important to us, what makes a rich and meaningful and fulfilling life. 
I wanted to have those conversations. And that for me is all about leadership. It's all about leadership of yourself and your family and your work in all aspects of life. It's about being the person you want to be. And it must be a demand for it too, because I think when I look as a speaker myself and they talk about topics, one of the ones almost listed always at the top is leadership. And so with, with that in mind, perhaps the listeners think about what are one or two or three things that are maybe tips, if you will, around the leadership space that would be you've learned that might be a good little reminder for me. I love this, have conversations with people about what's important to them, but what are maybe some tips around the leadership piece that might be helpful to people listening? A couple of things come to mind. Number one is that leadership is personal. There's no one definition of what is a successful leader. And you think about Rosa Parks, uh, and then you think about Elon Musk. But I mean, like two people who could easily be described as leaders. Right. How different could they be? <laughs> so right. It's just a great example that there is no formula for leadership. The most effective and powerful leaders are the people who are authentic and true to themselves. And you could easily argue that both Rosa Parks and Elon Musk are and were that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So be true to yourself. There's no one formula for successful leadership. So th th that's, the, I would say that's one of the most important things that I, that I talk to people about is being true to themselves. And something that goes very much with that is to develop a picture of what does successful leadership look like for you? What is your vision for your own effectiveness as a leader? Not what is your vision for the organization, which of course is also important, but right. your vision for yourself and your family and your work in your, your role as a leader. And that could be in the community, to, even with yourself. So to recognize it as personal and then to have a very clear picture of what does success look like. That's nice. And being true to yourself. I know there's, I comment on this in talks once in a while, the five regrets of the dying. And they interviewed a bunch of people in their mid nineties. And there was just a number of them about, I wish I would have stayed more in touch with friends. I, uh, I think another one is I wish I'd better taken better care of myself. But one of them was, I wish I'd lived a life truer to my own vision and not somebody else's, mm -hmm. i.e. our parents or my, the, the peer groups or whatever. And you think about people that I've listened to a lot of podcasts where they're entrepreneurs that go out and start something. It's a very famous company now, but at the time they left these big high paying jobs on wall street or whatever, because that's what the parents want. That's what the friends thought was important to have that and have the money in the boat and the car and stuff. So that be true to yourself is you hear that, but gosh, that it's so important. I think to, to really uh, emphasize that as if you will. So that's really neat. And so uh, tell me a little bit more about the coaching practice and some of the typical types of people that you deal with or how you find them or how that works? I work with a range of people. Uh, some people I work with who are at, at that similar place where I was, right? It's death by a thousand paper cuts. I know I don't want to be doing this, but I don't know what else to do or I don't know how to make a change. So some of the people I work with come, come to me in that kind of place. I also work with people who are successful leaders in an organization. They might be running an organization. They may be an owner of a small company and they are ready to go to the next level of leadership for themselves in their and their business because all good leaders know that the success of their organization is limited by their personal success an organization will never exceed the capability of its leader so if you want to if you're running a company or an organization or a team that team will never be more effective than you allow them to be through your leadership skills so those people are there i love working with people like that because they know it's me. If I want my company to do better, my team to do better, right. you know, even my family, if I want my family to do better, it's me. It comes back to me. And how do I change and how do I become more effective so that the people around me can be more effective? And, you know, and that makes me think of too, where there's that sort of blurred line between personal and professional and how that I would imagine once you left Apple and went into the leadership space and, and, and are doing all the things in the coaching things you're doing now, I just have to imagine you had a lot more time and availability with the family. Oh, absolutely. And one of the, th so part of, I also got divorced. That was part of my family story as well. And my son is with me half the time. And one of the reasons I am doing the work I am doing, not the only reason, but a reason is for that kind of flexibility. When he's around, I want to be around. Yeah. Yeah. And um, having that of a couple of sons that are now 37 and 27, boy, the time went by fast. It seems like they were just being born yesterday. So I'm, I just am so happy for you that too. So let's, let's get on to the book because I know that's very important. And, and 
I've told somebody recently, it might've been you, Rusty, but it was, I was saying that when I do talks and I'll ask how many people have written a book and one or two people might write a, uh, raise their hand rather out of 500 people. And then um, I've asked how many people were a pilot, something I've gotten a chance to do. So talk about the journey to the book and the, the book is breaking the code. And I just really want to uh, inspire people that may listen to this about if you have a book in mind, a lot of people say everybody has a book in their head, but just kind of the journey from the, the germination or sort of the start the first seed, if you will, till just coming out in this in this past week, which is quite a triumph, I'm sure. Oh, it's yeah, it feels great. Uh, and I'll tell you, a year ago, I had no intention of writing a book. Mm. Uh, it was it wasn't wasn't really on my mind. I said, oh, I don't really know what I would say. I don't have anything unique to add. So that's where I was a year ago. And over the next couple of months, through conversations with with the people in my network, going back to the, like those people in your network makes so much difference. I was getting a lot of encouragement to say, you do have something worthwhile to say, and there's, you can write a book, but I was still afraid of it. So my mm -hmm. first step was I decided I would write a book, but I would hire someone to write it for me. So I hired a ghostwriter. That was my first idea. But as I was going through that process, I discovered after a month or so that I wasn't getting the result that I wanted. And it was nothing to do with the ghostwriter. It had everything to do with me because what I realized is I had to wrestle with the material and struggle with it and figure out how to say it and what do I want to say. It wasn't working for me to outsource that to someone else. So I stopped that and I said, I'm just going to do it myself. And so I started again from scratch and I wrote the whole book myself. And it was a great process. The thing that I think helped me get over the finish line is I'm a very results oriented kind of person. I talk about A players in the book. A players are those people who are A students, people who are motivated and strive for the goals. And I'm definitely one of those people. I was very motivated to get good grades in, in school. I was motiva motivated to climb the ladder when I was in, working in a big corporation. And so for me, having a deadline saying, I'm going to launch this book at this point, that was very helpful for me in setting a schedule and sticking to it. So I, I'm going to stay on, on track with the book, but I just have to ask you this because of what you just said, A players. So Rusty Gaylor, where, where does the motivation come from? I, I got to get an A. And if I get an A, I get an A plus. And then I want to get a note from the teacher saying yours was the best. And I've gone down that road myself too. And for you, where did that motivation come from? Was it a parent, a coach, a, a, a professor, or, what, or just was it innate? What, where, where do you think that drive and motivation came for Rusty? I would say it's a combination of just my inherent nature. I was competitive. I have always been competitive. And it's also, it was rewarded in my home. My, that, mm. that kind of external success and climbing the ladder and getting good grades, all of that was rewarded at home. So it was a combination. It was something I was inclined to do and it was celebrated when I did it. So, you know, naturally I'm going to keep doing it. Excellent. Excellent. And so getting back to the book, and then I want to talk a little bit about just the book itself in a second, but prior to that, can you talk a little bit about the, you mentioned you wanted to do the ghostwriter and that wasn't going to be it. And just maybe your method of how you did it. Was it, you know, long overnight sessions, nonstop on the keyboard or whatever it was an hour here, hour there. How did you kind of break down? Cause it's a, a little bit of that eating the elephant thing a little bit too. How did you kind of break down the process? The first thing that I did was figure out when am I most effective at writing? And mm -hmm. I figured out for me, that was in the morning. And so I blocked out time to write in the morning. It is so tempting to sit down to write and say, well, I'm just going to check my email first. And now Gosh. I'm going to read a little bit of the news. And you know, it's like, we can come up with so many reasons to avoid it. So find the time of day that works, sit down and do it. And then the other thing for me is I just have to start. Inevitably, I know once I get moving, the words come out more easily. But I could spend hours on the first three sentences, which yeah. is just silly. It's yeah. much better to write the first three sentences, let them give yourself permission for them to be bad and keep going. Mm. Uh, and once you get, once you get in a role, then, then the words will flow more easily and you can always go back and edit. It's way easier to edit than it is to create. And I took advantage of that by just lowering the bar on the creation process. Yeah. And I think sometimes having that experience with books myself, the, you said the editing is easy part. It's true. When everything flows out, 
and you just get all this information down on paper and you can break it down into outlines or modules or, or part one, part two, what have you. Uh, I found the editing was something that really I, I found that have it was easier for me to find somebody to do it because it's so well, you just started a sentence with that without in the previous sentence before you can't do that again. And there's a lot of things like that, too. So so let's get to the book. Talk to us to talk to the listeners a little bit about the book, the title and what it's about and how it might be something they want to get. So the title is Breaking the Code, Stop Looking for Answers and Start Enjoying Life. Mm. And breaking the code is we've talked a little bit about this, this A player code of, you know, but we all have a code, whether it's an A player code or something else. And the code is really just your habits, your patterns, the way you think, the way you operate in life. One of the examples I give people is when I walked away from Apple after 13 years, 25 years of a corporate career, 13 years at Apple, I was successful, well-paid, great company, one of the most known companies in the world, stable job all of these, you know, good benefits, all of that. And I, I decided to leave. How do you, what would your reaction be to a close friend or a neighbor or even your spouse or partner leaving a job like that? Would you feel excited? Would you feel like, would you think that's crazy? So just in that moment, in that example, it's, it reveals part of your code, mm. what you believe about the world, what you think is a good idea or a bad idea. Is it a great idea to leave a stable and predictable job to go start your own business and do what you feels meaningful and purposeful to you? Or is it crazy to do that because you're walking away stability from stability? There's no right answer to that, but your answer is a reflection of your code. So when I talk about breaking the code, if you want to achieve a new level of success, you have to acknowledge and recognize that you have some rules that you're following. That's your code. Mm -hmm. And everybody has rules that they follow about life and they will produce a certain outcome. You know, it's, it's I, I, we get hit with statistical data all the time. I just have to believe that the vast majority of people wouldn't do that because it's just sort of like this whole get married, get, go to school, go to high school, go to college, get married, have 2.5 kids, get a good job, work there 50 years, get a gold watch, retire, and then go like course retirement you know, I'm up there in, in ages. I said to somebody the other day, I said, I don't know if I'm going to say my age as much as, but I actually saw the Beatles twice when they came to town in 1965 <laughs> from the second row. But, um, but when you get up there and you've been there long enough, that was the model and get the gold watch and retire. And re retirement was thought of as this, this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I've got friends that are retiring now that sure don't have much to do. And they look like they're bored stiff and they've kind of lost their purpose. So, but I think it's sort of sad because wouldn't you think, and hopefully that's why this book will help a lot of people that I, I just think the majority of people take the safe route. It just seems to me, did you ever find that kind of in the discussions you have different people about the routes they would go? Absolutely. So many people take the safe route. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. funny that you mentioned retirement because chapter two is called forget retirement. Oh, great. You know, as long as you are uh, following that traditional path that you laid out, and so many people do follow that traditional path, the you know, get married, good job, promotion, 2.5 kids, and so on. You're thinking about retirement because you're thinking about freedom. You think, well, what do I, once I've done my dues, once I've paid my dues, then what can I do? Then maybe I can do what I really want to do. But if you are enjoying the process, you're not thinking about retirement. That's one of the things that became so clear to me once I switched jobs. When I was working at Apple, I thought about retirement all the time. But now that I'm a coach and enjoying the work I do and I'm challenged and I'm growing, I don't think about it because it, it, I have the freedom that I was expecting would only come in the future once I got the gold watch and walked out the door. I have that freedom now, today. Exactly. So it integrates into my life in a way that's, well, I'm not looking forward to this thing happening in the future because it's happening now. And that is one of those, that's breaking the code. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, most people will say, oh, that's impossible. You can't have that. Or you're so lucky because you had that. But I was one of those people who said all those things five years ago, and now I do have it. So I'm living proof that you can change and you can have this. And I think that's such an important lesson for people to take away because all of the reasons you have for why this won't work for you. I don't know the right people. I don't have the right education. I haven't saved enough money. My kids are still in college, whatever it is, their reasons but you can have reasons or you can have results. Take your pick. 
See, and I think that's what's really cool, and this is what's fun about a podcast or anywhere where you're getting your message out to people, is that it kind of reminds me of, gosh, if Rusty can do this, you can do it too. And there's something about we still seem to be a, a, a nation, a world, or whatever, of followers. I'm thinking back to junior high where nobody would sit there and, and go dancing and be all the girls on one side of the gym and the guys on the other side. And finally, one brave soul would go out and ask her and they'd start dancing. Then everybody started dancing. So it's like, so if Rusty can do it, so I think that's going to inspire people. And I think um, that's why I'm really fascinated too about chapter two, Forget Retirement, because uh, I remember going out on what was it, 10 or 15 years ago with a gal and I said something about work and she goes, 3,722. And I, I asked you about your job. What does it mean? That's how many days till I retire. I, it well, was like 10 years. I'm like, you're counting the days, like the X's on the calendar that's going down. So what other little, in, in terms of just the breakdown, we can't go through the whole book, of course, but chapter two, forget retirement. Any other little tidbits, comments about how to get people on a different path. I think the word purpose is so important, but what, what are some other things you cover in chapter two? Well, so I, I'll, I'm not going to talk more about chapter two, but I'll mention that mm. I, one of the things about follow the code is I actually use code as an acronym and mm. that C O D E is a process that you can follow. The C is for confront and you have to confront the things in your life that are not working the way you want them to be. Uh, it, you know, for me, that was a work work that was not fulfilling when I was working at Apple. Not, a, a, and this is the, this is the thing is, I was still grateful for everything I had, but you can feel grateful and still want more. Yes, I think that's a very important point. And so, C is to confront that truth in your life about where do you want more satisfaction and fulfillment and freedom in your life. O is to optimize. And optimizing is what we're talking about code and your belief system. You have to change the way you think. As long as you think I could never do that, you're never going to do it. So optimize is looking at those places, looking at those beliefs, those thoughts you have that hold you back and optimize them. Say, well, I could do that. Rusty could do it. He's no different. He doesn't have anything I don't have. So I right. could do that. Right. D is for design. Design is to create a picture of success for you. We were talking about leadership at the beginning and how leadership is personal. So D is an essential part of this process because you have to design your own version of success. Mm. That could be as a leader of your company, as a leader in your company. It could be in your life. It could be the kind of freedom that you integrate in your life to be present with your family and have a successful job. You get to design that. And then E finally is execute, which is, of course, this is great to have new empowering beliefs and to have a design of what success looks like, but you got to take some action steps or it'll never happen. And that's so good. I'm going to use that as our, I think our biggest takeaways of the day. So well, we've got to wrap up in a few minutes. Where can people get the book and what's the easiest way for them to connect with you? The book is available on Amazon, Breaking the Code, and it helps if you search by Breaking the Code Rusty, because there's a number of uh, other books by that same title out there, but uh, none by me. <laughs> so if you search for Breaking the Code Rusty on Amazon, you'll find it there. Best way to connect with me is two places. One is on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm there regularly, and you can find me at Rusty Gaylord on LinkedIn. And you can also find me at my website, RustyGaylord.com. I send out a, a weekly email, which I is just, it's got some tips and tricks in there for people to help be better leaders in their life. So that's uh, something you can check out on my, on my website. And my, of course, my book information is there as well. Excellent. I will put those in the show notes also for those that uh, are getting this on, uh, where they can look at it and see it online or on their phone. Um, my last question, and before I get to some of the takeaways that I got from you, Rusty, is it's always one of my favorite questions I like to ask my guests kind of as we wrap up. Uh, I never ask them their age. That's their business. But what do you, if you can only pick one thing, what do you know today uh, that would have helped you and you would have liked to have known when you were 18? Wow. Well, that's a great question. I would say that the, the one thing is that it's okay and actually a good thing to follow your heart. Mm. One of the things I talk about in that optimize and design, that C-O-D-E in the optimize and design process is a willingness to follow your heart. Your heart, because you, as you said, we've all been trained to follow this very traditional path. I describe that as your code. If you're gonna break the code to what end? Well, it's to do something that's more personally meaningful to you. And how do you find that? You have to be willing to follow your heart. 
Yeah, excellent, excellent. So some of the takeaways that I kind of look at are with around your leadership, of course, the, the career at Apple and, and at one point saying, I just can't do this anymore. And thankfully you were younger and you didn't, we weren't there for the 50 years and got the gold watch. I don't know if they still do gold watches, but I like the leadership about leadership is personal. And your, your comment about Rosa Parks and Elon Musk is a great example. Be true to yourself, which is a theme that is so important. It's kind of like follow your heart as well. Uh, develop a picture of what it looks like in the future. I, I think that sometimes is a future vision, but I think the, um, the code acronym CONFRONT, which is in many ways acknowledging, and, and they say that just acknowledging that you have a situation, rather some people, that's half the battle and so forth. Optimize is changing the way you think you can change. Uh, some people, it's just, I, I had a father who was very negative and I'd say, it's a sunny day. It's going to, he goes, it's going to rain tomorrow. So there's going to be somebody you, you have, you know, you don't have to do anything, but it's preferable if you change how you think design is part of that, having that vision, everything starts with a thought in our mind and we see it here and then we put it into action and then execute, which is taking action and, uh, and following up on, on the plan that you set the vision you had and the plan and maybe the steps to get there. So, well, Rusty, thank you so much for being a guest. I really appreciate it. No, David, it's great. I it's so it's I enjoy talking to you, and uh, I hope, hope we got some good takeaways and nuggets for. for I think we definitely did. We definitely did for sure. So those were some of those takeaways that I did, and I think the listeners got the same. So, uh, as we wrap up, my podcast is available every Tuesday morning at five a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, and is available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, and other uh, podcast networks. Uh, please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. To purchase a gratitude journal or find out more about my gratitude speaking and coaching, you can connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com or thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. And also, if you'd like to receive my weekly Monday morning minute, I send out a one-minute video every Monday morning at six in the morning. Just go to your text and text 22828. That's a five-digit number, 22828. And in the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word, and they will send you a link to get signed up for that. And also as an exclusive for my podcast listeners, I'm offering my six-month proprietary gratitude coaching program that can transform your life for the three-month price. And so just email me or connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com and mention you heard it on my podcast. So finally, thanks for tuning in. And until next time, I'm David George Brook, That Gratitude Guy. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.